So please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. I'm, I'm more than happy about that. Uh, the slides in the lecture uh, will be available. And uh, again, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this lecture. And as James said, I'm a researcher at the Doherty Institute at the University of Melbourne in, in Australia. And I thought I would give you a very short background of how I got to where I am. I did my PhD in computational biology at the University of Sydney, uh, which I completed in, in 2015. Feels like uh, a long time ago now. And then I did a short postdoc in the same university working on virus phylogenetics. In 2016, I joined the University of Melbourne um, through an initiative that they have called the McKenzie Fellowship. In. And this is a fellowship that lets you do sort of independent research within the University of Melbourne, and you must be hosted by, by a group. So I joined a group doing bacterial genomics. And that is a scheme, by the way, that is available to anyone not doing their PhDs at Melbourne Uni. And then I joined the Doherty Institute, also within the University of Melbourne, as an Australian Research Council Fellow. And this is a fellowship scheme from the Australian government that lets anyone really um, get uh, funding to do, to do independent research for uh, three years, uh, and you can get extensions to unis and things like that. So um, if you're ever interested in going to Australia, let me know. There's a few opportunities around. And the material that I will present today, uh, some of it comes from previous workshops uh, for which I've had different contributors. At the University of Melbourne, my team, um, Ash Porter, Waitama Worth, and Leo um, have, have done some of the, just provided some of the content in these slides. But we've also run previous workshops, I think over the past 15 years or so, at the University of Sydney, Australian National University, and Queensland University of Technology. And these are some of the the contributors over there. Also, if you're interested in some of the material that I will present today and want to get a more in-depth understanding, there's different workshops happening around the world um, with uh, that will basically just deal with phylogenetics. One of them is Sending the Beast. It's happened in, in Europe and in South Pacific and also in Canada, I believe. Um, in Sydney, there's a, a phylogenetics workshop that happens every year around June. And we also run one at the University of Melbourne. Uh, it's usually a virtual workshop, so if you want to attend, then please email me later. All right, so I thought I would start by talking about how to interpret phylogenetic trees. Some of this will be very obvious to a lot of you, but um, it's just so that we all have the same baseline to, to go into the more advanced stuff. So in general, we say that a phylogenetic tree is, or a phylogeny is the true evolutionary relationship between a set of organisms. And the tree shown here to your left is, um, that's uh, Charles Darwin's first diagram of what would ultimately be a phylogenetic tree. And this is a tree here showing uh, relationships between different animal species. And, and this is one that we might use in a more practical context. So this is a tree of HIV uh, from a 2016 paper. And the, the first thing to note is that trees have different components and we need to we have some terminology that that, that makes it easy to to talk between people that are discussing trees so the first one is that these points here are known as tips also known as terminal nodes or leaves in in the biological literature we usually use the term tip but if you read more mathematical papers they might use terms like leaves or, or terminal nodes these divergence events within the trees are known as internal nodes and they represent um, divergence events, either a given genetic distance or a given time. And then uh, these lines here, of course, are known as branches, but if you read more mathematically inclined papers, they might refer to them as edges, but they're the exact same thing. And this is a very important internal node known as the root, and it corresponds to the origin of this particular HIV outbreak. A group of samples uh, that are closely related, that uh, which stem from a single node, such as those shown here, is known as a clade or a monophyletic group. So clade and monophyletic group are synonymous. And whatever falls next to them, so whatever branched, um, yeah, just right next to it, is known as a sister lineage or a sister taxon. Uh, trees can represent different uh, kinds of information. This one shown here is known as a phylogram. And the first thing to know is that this is a tree of uh, extant um, 
mammals. So all these are, are animals that exist in the present. But note that the tree has these branches that don't quite align here to the present. So I know that this is a phylogram, and this is because the branch lines measure the amount of evolutionary change. So this could be perhaps a uh, change in the size of the skull, or uh, but usually molecular evolution. So uh, the number of substitutions along a gene or along the whole genome or a chromosome. But phylogenetic trees can also be chronograms, and a chronogram is a kind of a is a kind of phylogenetic tree where the branch lines correspond to time. So in this context, because these organisms all exist in the present, uh, the tree has to be ultrametric. An ultrametric tree is one where all the tips align at, at this, um, basically at the same point in time. So it's it's important to have that, to be very clear about the difference between chronograms and phylograms when you estimate phylogenetic trees. And depending on what programs you use, you might be estimating phylograms or chronograms. Uh, because of the time scale over which these organisms evolve, we would think that these branch lines would correspond to uh, probably millions of years, but they could represent years, weeks, uh, days, even. And this is a non-ultrametric chronogram. So not all chronograms have to be ultrametric. For example, these being viruses that have been sampled over the course of a few years, uh, we, we just don't expect the chronograms to, to to be ultrametric. So not all these tips have to align at the same point in time because they have been collected over time. So there is a situation where our samples, or our, rather our population, is measurably evolving. So if we collect samples today and in a few days' time, we expect some evolutionary change. So we have to incorporate that into our chronograms, whereas we wouldn't have to do that if we were analyzing, say, mammals. Um, and in this case, again, branch lines correspond to time because this is a a virus that is evolving relatively quickly. Uh, these could correspond to calendar dates. And you would note that there is a scale bar here <clears throat> showing us calendar years. So, so the units of the branch lines must be years. And then this node here, known as the root, would correspond to the, again, the origin of the outbreak, also known as the time to the most recent common ancestor, or the TMRCA. So you might read papers that refer to the TMRCA quite a lot. TMRCA is the, the age of the root of the tree which you can express in years from the latest collected sample, from the youngest samples, or <clears throat> in, a, like in, a, in a calendar year. So in this case, 1950-something. Uh, and there's different ways that we can represent phylogeny trees. Uh, nowadays, because we have very large data sets, we often see these circular trees. But this is um, when this tree was, was, um, was published. Uh, we didn't publish too many uh, circular trees, but these are very useful when you have lots of samples because you can you have more space to display them. Um, and the branchness could be genetic distance or time, so these could be phylograms or chronograms. They're also handy when you want to display lots of information here. So um, these are different pathotypes, but you can have antimicrobial resistance, geographic location, or other things in these trees, of course. And phylogenetic trees can also be displayed as unrooted. This is when we do not know what the position of the root node should be. This tree here is a tree of SARS-CoV-2 uh, from this paper in 2020. And this paper investigated what the actual root of the SARS-CoV-2 tree is. Believe it or not, that is still uncertain. And um, yeah, so they just looked at different root positions and, and how, how much statistical support they had. But note that these trees are uh, phylograms. So unrooted trees would typically be phylograms such that the branches, branch lengths would represent genetic change. If they were chronograms, then the root position is obvious. It's whatever uh, makes the tree ultrametric, if you have samples collected at the same point in time, or whatever makes the times um, kind of align correctly. And now uh, I just want to, I'll have a few concept reviews throughout the lecture, and this is the first one. So just as a recap of what we've discussed, trees have different parts, the root node, internal nodes, tips, and branches or edges. And these have synonyms in the, um, in the mathematical literature. Uh, there's also different kinds of trees that we, can, uh, that we can display or that we can infer. The first one being phylograms, where the branches correspond to uh, usually genetic distance, but they could be anything that you're measuring uh, in evolutionary context, such as size of bones uh, or, or genetic change. 
And in that case, when it's genetic change, they would, um, the units would tend to be substitutions per site. Biogenic trees can also be chronograms, where the branches correspond to units of time. And another kind of uh, tree that I didn't talk about here is uh, cladograms. So cladograms are trees where the branch lengths have no meaning. For example, if you just want to display the topology, the evolutionary relationships between a set of samples, then uh, you might just have a cladogram. Uh, and then you have to be very clear that the branch lengths don't, uh, should not be interpreted. They have no meaning. All right. And now uh, I would like to introduce some concepts around how we infer phylogenetic trees now that we know how to understand them and how they are displayed. There's different methods to infer phylogenetic trees, and this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the most common methods. Uh, maximum parsimony, distance-based methods, maximum likelihood, and Bayesian inference. And I've put here also some of the most popular programs that you might use to infer phylogenetic trees. Um, there's many, many more, but um, I did a, a Google Scholar search the other day, and these would be the those that have more citations. I've also underlined here uh, distance-based methods, maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference, because they explicitly use uh, models of, because we'll be talking about molecular data, models of molecular evolution. Maximum parsimony uh, uses a, arguably, it does use a, a model of molecular evolution, but it's an extremely simplistic one. So it has fallen out of favor for molecular data. You can still use it if you want. And it has some very useful applications for, especially for morphological uh, data sets. Right, so let's go to an example of how maximum parsimony generally works. And we'll use this example of, of bare sequences. This could be maybe a part of the mitochondrial genome or any sequence that you like. And what we do with, with uh, maximum parsimony is we will consider a tree. So I will just propose this tree um, and then um, look, map basically this site that I have selected here in red and put it against the tree, and then it will count how many changes would have had to occur for this site um, under this tree. So if you know here, we've got two Cs and two Ts, and they are not monophyletic. So that particular site would require at least two changes under this tree. If you go through all of the sites, then in total, you need seven, uh, seven changes to explain this alignment under this tree. And then we'll propose a few other trees under this one here. Um, there's also seven steps, but this one here has six steps. In particular, that site only requires the one step. So we would select this uh, last tree here. Um, if you can see my mouse pointer, then it's this one. Otherwise, it's just the bottom right. And this would be our maximum parsimony tree. So the goal of maximum parsimony, I hope is obvious at this stage, is to minimize the number of evolutionary changes. And as a summary of maximum parsimony, we, we aim to identify the tree topology that can explain the sequence data using the smallest number of inferred substitution events. Uh, as I said before, it's commonly used for morphological data and nowadays rarely used for analyzing genetic data. And the reason is that it cannot estimate evolutionary rates or time scales, and it is sensible, uh, sensitive to multiple substitutions. So if you have a little bit of uh, substitutional saturation, you can have different problems with with maximum parsimony. Right, so, um, and again, that, that's just the conceptual framework behind uh, maximum parsimony, but, but what about these uh, model-based methods? Well, substitution models in phylogenetics take this general form. Uh, we usually have a, a rate matrix that will tell us about the probability of changing from one nucleotide to another. And of course, you can expand this to um, amino acid or protein data, but we'll use uh, nucleotides just to simplify this example. But you can, you can you'll use the same modeling framework, basically. So the rate matrix, again, will tell us about the probability of changing, say, from an A to a T or an A to a G and so on. We will also specify base frequency, so the proportions of A, C, Gs, and Ts, and of course, those have to sum up to one. And we will also incorporate these site rate uh, components of the model. So again, this is just a basic modeling framework. And if you're mathematically inclined, this is a simple Markovian process. 
And we can actually parameterize this framework in a few different ways. When you run your phylogenetics programs, which you will do later today, um, you will see that the substitution model can take different names. And the names correspond to different parameterizations of this framework. The simplest is called the JC for Jukes Cantor and this model. Uh, a, B, C, D, E, and F are exactly the same. That is the probability of changing from an A to a T, A to a C, and so on, are exactly the same. We will also assume that base frequencies are the same, and we have not incorporated this I and J uh, aspects of the model, which I'll talk more about in a couple of slides. And under this model, you have zero free parameters. Another model that is frequently used is the HKY. And under the HKY, um, a, C, D, and F from the, the rate matrix are the same, and B and E are, are the same, but, but those two being different. So what this model posits is that transitions occur at a different rate to transversions, which biochemically makes sense. So if you map these A, C, D, and F here and the rate matrix, then you will note that uh, they correspond to, to transitions, whereas uh, B and E correspond to transversions. We will also allow under this model uh, for different frequencies of A, C, Gs, and Ts. And again, we're not including these I and G components. Under this model, we have four free parameters. So three parameters, three free parameters from the base frequencies, and then one for the transition to transversion ratio. I'm just gonna check the chat quickly. Um, yeah, cool. So if, if anyone has any questions, then please interrupt me or, or put something on the chat and I'll check it periodically. Um, another model is the GTR, which stands for general time reversible. And under this model, A, B, C, D, and F are different. Uh, base frequencies will also be different. In this scenario, we're still not including these I and G components. And this model has eight free parameters. And then the most flexible model that we can propose is called the GTR plus I plus G. Under this model, um, again, A, B, C, D, and F are different, also different base frequencies. We're also including these I and G components, such that the model has 10 free parameters. So we're, I, I've just walked you through a couple of models, but going from the simplest to the more, most complex of the substitution models. Now let's talk about those I and G components in the substitution model. Um, ah, wait. Just one more thing here. So note that the, the first, um, maybe in the GTR plus I plus G, this GTR aspect is just the matrix that we're using and the base frequencies. I and G are independent of the rate matrix and the base frequencies. And I hope that becomes apparent in the next few slides, but of course, let me, let me know if not. So what is the intuition behind the, these um, site rate components, the I and G? And the motivation behind this really is that if you look at a sequence alignment, this is a portion of, of a real sequence alignment, uh, you'll note that some sites are constant. This one, for example, appears to be constant. Some of them have maybe just one change. This, you might think that there was just a substitution from a T to an A here, and this one has at least two substitutions. So we'll classify these sites as being slowly evolving sites, medium evolving sites, and fast evolving sites. Of course, you can have more classifications, but but the idea is that sites, not all sites evolve at the same rate. Not all, all sites have the same probabilities of changing. And this might occur for reasons uh, including um, secondary structure, or if you code for some important protein, then maybe first and second coding positions would evolve a lot slower than third coding positions and, and those sorts of things. Um, so the when you do not include these site rate components, so when you have substitution models such as JC, GTR, and HKY, uh, we have a single rate. We assume that all sites evolve at the same rate. All sites have the same probability of accumulating some substitution. When we include the plus i component, all that is really doing is it says that some sites, a proportion of sites, have a probability of zero of evolving. So we'll assign them a rate of zero. Therefore, only one minus whatever that proportion of, of invariable sites is uh, will be able to evolve. So this I stands for the number or the proportion rather of invariable sites. And the plus G, so if you see models like JC plus G, GTR plus G and so on, posits the following. 
we will use a gamma distribution. You could use any other continuous distribution, but uh, but in phylogenetics, we almost always use a gamma. And we will this we will make the, the call that this distribution designates uh, rates of evolution among sites in the alignment. So under a gamma distribution, uh, you have you have two parameters, but there's only one that we care about in phylogenetics, and that is the alpha parameter. And alpha parameter is the shape of the gamma distribution. If alpha is not 0.5, then the distribution looks like this, like the red one here. So very skewed. What that means is that most sites, note that we've got the proportion of sites along the y-axis, will evolve very slowly, and a few of them will evolve very quickly. In contrast, if alpha was, say, 100, then the distribution looks a bit more Gaussian like this one, meaning that most sites have a rate that uh, that is around some sort of value, a few of them evolving very slowly and a few of them evolving uh, quicker. The alpha parameter is one that we have to estimate in our model, just as the proportion of the variable sites if we were including a model with, uh, with the plus i. In practice, the way this gamma distribution works is we will discretize it into four um, into four bins, so sites can fall into either of those four bins. You can discretize it into more categories if you like. You can even have a continuous distribution, but when you run your analysis in Beast later today, you will have to choose the number of categories, and, and four is, is the default. But again, that's kind of arbitrary. You can choose different numbers of, of categories for this distribution if you think that there's more rates than that, that apply to your, to your alignment. And of course, you can combine I and G. Some authors believe that this is um, bad practice because when you include a proportion of invariable sites, you, uh, you're you also giving information to the gamma distribution. So you tend to have higher values for alpha. So uh, it's kind of pushing your, your gamma distribution to be higher. So it's said that these are non-identifiable, but you can specify these in your models. And what that would, would imply is that you have a proportion of sites that are invariable and then those sites that can change will uh, will change according to it or will evolve according to some gamma distribution with some alpha parameter. All right, so when we consider the ensemble of our evolutionary models, our molecular evolutionary models, uh, there's different com combinations that you can take. I've only talked about a few of them. But the ways, you, the number of ways that you can parameterize your rate matrix is, 100, is 200 and and three, the number of ways you can parameterize your base frequencies is 15, and, um, and and the number of ways that you can include your site rates or not is uh, is 14. So ultimately, there's 12,180 substitution models. But in phylogenetics, we only consider a small subset. So generally, those that have names. But note that there's many ways that you can parameterize these models. And maybe for substitution models, it doesn't matter. For nucleotide substitution models, it doesn't matter as much. But if you were analyzing, say, protein sequence data, then it might matter more. And in that case, we've got many. Um, actually, we often use models where the parameters are already fixed. But if you wanted to to estimate them, then there's there's many more combinations that you can use, and which might make more biological sense. I'll check whether there. Okay, so no questions in the chat. That's all good. So now we'll move to one of the algorithms or the approaches that we can use to estimate phylogenetic trees using um, explicit substitution or molecular evolutionary models. And the the only one that I'll talk about here really is neighbor joining because it's the most popular and it's also quite handy. Um, it has a few problems, but, but it's extremely quick. So I often use it just to explore what my diet looked like. So again, we'll consider our sequence alignment of the, the bare data. And uh, we'll have this matrix that tells us about uh, the genetic distance between these different samples. And we'll start with a tree that is completely unresolved. So this tree contains no information. It is known as a, as a star tree or, uh, or a tree that has a polytomy at the base at the, at the root. So once we've used our substitution model to calculate the, the pairwise distance between all our samples, what we'll do is we'll say, well, whoops, ah, yeah. we'll say, well, fine. So the cave bear and the brown bear have the smallest genetic distance, 0.1. So we'll put those, we'll cluster those two together. Next come the black bear. So we'll cluster that one with those. 
and then we've got the giant panda line here. So it's a method that uh, works quickly in the sense that we're not proposing trees like we did for maximum parsimony. We're actually using the genetic distance matrix to uh, cluster these samples together. So again, very quickly. Um, But does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions? All right. Now, the methods that you'll use most often will be maximum likelihood and Bayesian methods. And we'll talk about maximum likelihood first. So uh, in maximum likelihood, our goal is to calculate a likelihood of a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is a, is a whole model. So it includes phylogenetic trees and substitution models, which we've talked about for now. And the likelihood is formally the probability of the data, uh, D, given the hypothesis again. So our model and our model here includes the substitution model and, and the trait. Uh, another way to formulate it is given uh, my model, again, the tree and the substitution model, what is the probability of, of observing the alignment that I have at hand? And this is the way uh, maximum likelihood works or likelihood calculations work intuitively. Uh, the, the likelihood is a very important concept in phylogenetics. We will also use it for, for Bayesian inference, which we'll talk about a bit later. Imagine this matrix that tells us about the probability of changing from, from one base to another. And what we'll do is we'll consider this tree here and we'll map one side in the alignment. So a, one side in the alignment is AAC. And at each internal node, we will consider the probability of having any base at, uh, at, any, um, at any of these nodes. So we'll calculate the probability of an A staying constant throughout the length of this branch. Um, or if it was C, G, T and changing to an A. And then we will consider all possible combinations so, such that all these red lines can, uh, consist of all the combinations that would have given rise to this particular site. The likelihood then is, is the, the result of combining all these possibilities. So it's a probability calculation. And we will need to do that for every site in the alignment and then multiply them. So the likelihood of a sequence alignment is the product of the likelihoods of the individual sites. This means, um, if you work out an example by hand, that likelihood calculations end up being really, really small. Therefore, we typically use a log scale. And that means that we don't have to multiply the likelihoods across sites, but we can just add them. And that means that we can speed up computation by using graphical processing units and, and, other, and other approaches. Uh, so the fact that likelihoods are small and that we can log them means that uh, our calculations are just more convenient. So for maximum likelihood, what we do is, is a similar approach to maximum parsimony in that we, we can't just, uh, by clustering, obtain a tree. We will have to propose different trees. And the way we would do this is we would take a sequence alignment and calculate the, the phylogenetic likelihood for the whole alignment for different trees. So here we have a few different options. And then this tree here at the bottom, which coincidentally is the same tree that we had for maximum likelihood, has the lowest log likelihood value. So I put just here in a star. So it's the least negative value here. And of course, these values are negative because we're looking at, at log probabilities, log likelihood tree. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Now, the problem is, fine, so we can calculate the likelihood of lots of trees, but the number of trees, even for a medium-sized data set, is, is huge. These days, a, a data set with 20 samples is, is actually quite small, but the number of trees that we would need to explore if we wanted to explore all possible trees is huge, 10 to the power of 20. So what we usually do is we will use heuristics. We will not visit every possible tree. We will uh, probably start maybe with a clustering tree, so a neighbor joining tree, and then modify it in a few different ways and use uh, different algorithms. So you can use genetic algorithms, uh, hill climbing algorithms, and, and many others to explore tree space. Um, the most, uh, the quickest maximum likelihood approaches, what they do is they can speed likelihood calculations, but more importantly, they're very good at traversing tree space and finding the best tree, the maximum likelihood tree uh, for a data set. Um, however, because many data sets are very large, what some authors of, of phylogenetics uh, programs suggest is uh, that we refer to the best tree that we find as the maximum likelihood known tree, because you cannot guarantee that you have explored all, all trees. 
Um, okay, so just as a summary of maximum likelihood, uh, we need to use <clears throat> heuristic approaches to explore tree space, again, because there's so many trees. Also note that for maximum likelihood, our output is a single estimate of a phylogenetic tree and parameters, and those are known as the MLE, so the maximum likelihood estimate. And if we want to obtain our uncertainty around our tree and branch lengths, we can use bootstrapping, which I'll talk about next. <clears throat> And so far, I have only talked about estimating phylogenetic trees, but of course, <clears throat> you will also obtain estimates for your substitution models. But if you want to do things like estimating evolutionary rates, times, or even demographic parameters, you will need to take uh, additional approaches. So the basic uh, maximum likelihood framework in phylogenetics will only give you a phylogenetic tree and, and substitution model parameters. You can use maximum likelihood to, to infer all these things, times and, and demographic parameters that we'll talk about later, but those would be independent steps in your in under this under this approach. All right. So let's talk briefly about bootstrapping, which is still the most popular approach to getting uncertainty to yeah, to, to gauging uncertainty in, in maximum likelihood analysis. And this is the way it works. We'll use our uh, bare sequence alignment. And what we will do is we will resample the alignment with replacement a number of times. So this is called pseudo replication. And we'll, we'll run through one example first. What we'll do is we've taken this alignment and then the, the site chosen here in red is sampled once. So we'll put that in our, in this alignment here at the bottom. This alignment at the bottom is a pseudo replicate alignment. Then we'll sample this site here. Uh, just a column of t's, then this side here, and then because we're sampling with replacement, we're sampling this side just with t's, the, the column that only has t's, uh, twice. And then we'll end up with a pseudo replicate alignment. Once we have the pseudo replicate alignment, we will run our maximum likelihood analysis, and we will do this, say, a thousand times. And then what we can do is we'll take our maximum likelihood tree that we estimated with the initial alignment, and we'll count the number of times that any of these clades are found within the bootstrap replicates. For example, if the brown bear and cave bear were monophyletic, so form a clade in, um, in all of the 1,000 replicates, pseudo, uh, pseudo replicates that we, that we ran, then we'll say that it has a bootstrap support of 100%. In contrast, if roughly half of the time uh, the black bear was, uh, was clustered together with the brown bear and the cave bear, the, yeah, then we'll say that it has a, a bootstrap, uh, bootstrap support of about 50.4%. In general, we express bootstrap values as percentages as opposed to probability, so not values between zero and one because they're not strictly probabilities, they're bootstrap replicates. In Bayesian analysis, we do have proper probability, so we'll express these as, as, as posterior probabilities, but again, we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, another result of bootstrapping is that because with each pseudo replicate, you're conducting a new uh, maximum likelihood analysis. You can also get uncertainty around branch lengths and, and other parameters of interest. Mm. Ah, one thing to note about bootstrapping is that each bootstrap replicate is independent. So if you can parallelize your analysis, then then this might will be a lot faster than just running each bootstrap replicate uh, one after the other. So uh, multiprocessing definitely helps here from a computational standpoint. But the other thing is. There's been a lot of work understanding how Bootstrap uh, performs in phylogenetics. And if you use IQ tree, it has an option called ultra fast boost bootstrapping. And the ultra fast bootstrapping uh, uses a, a simplified version of maximum likelihood search to obtain the, the bootstrap tree. So the argument there is that it's best to have a lot of replicates that might not have the optimal search strategy rather than having a small number of replicates with, with the optimal search strategy. And those will run very quickly. So IQtree is very clever at, um, uh, at using the resources from your machine and, and optimizing these bootstrap replicates so that they run rather quickly. Uh, now concept, a concept review around what we've just discussed. So uh, maximum parsimony does not use an explicit substitution model. Arguably, it does use a model, which is that the shortest evolutionary path is the optimal one, but but not substitution models, as we've explained them before using this uh, this framework that involves a rate matrix, base frequency, and all these things, uh, site rate components in particular. So 
uh, gamma and, and, and invariable sites. Uh, distance methods are very fast, and they're I think they're extremely useful for an exploratory phase, uh, just to see what your data kind of look like. But they do not use all the information for tree building. So note that we use these pairwise distances to estimate the tree. So we're not using the full alignment at each uh, stage. Maximum likelihood is a true statistical approach in that it involves this likelihood function. Uh, but obtaining uncertainty usually requires additional approaches, notably bootstrapping. There are other methods that I didn't talk about here. And one that I would draw your attention to if you're interested in this sort of, uh, in this work is concordance factors. Concordance factor factors measure uh, or quantify the number of sites that support a particular grouping. So if you have two taxa together, the brown bear and the cave bear, for example, uh, the concordance factor is the number, the proportion of your alignment that supports that particular grouping. So it can be very useful if you have very large data sets and it's very quick to compute. Uh, ah, I've also listed throughout this talk uh, some recommended references. So if you want to read more about um, Phylogenic inference, I, I do recommend this book by Lyndall Bromham. Um, it has a few different chapters discussing maximum likelihood, distance methods, and substitution models in, in more depth than I have done here, and using a very intuitive uh, kind of biological approach. Oh, yep. All right. So the question is, regarding substitution models, is it OK to trust the prediction of the tool Order, is there a way of manual improvement? Mm. So you mean the, the actual, so choosing the substitution model? Uh, you mean when you run IQ tree and you get, uh, it does this model test and it tells you what the best model is? Okay, I, I, am, I have a few opinions on this. So um, for everyone's clarity, IQ tree runs, when you run it by default, it has this option called uh, model test. Is, is it just called model test? I think it's just called model test. And what it does is it will use a statistical approach, namely AIC, BIC, or, or one of those optimality criteria to choose the best substitution model. And it will traverse model space. So it will test a few different models and tell you what the best model for your data should be. <clears throat> if you let it run the default, then it will just use that model throughout. Um, model selection, in my view, model selection used to be very important when data sets were very small uh, because you, you have, you're working with very few variable sites. These days, the most important component of substitution models is including the site rate category. So if you do not account for the possibility that, or, or the fact that that is the case, that most of your sites are constant, for instance, I analyze a lot of SARS-CoV-2 data, and, and most of the genome is constant. There's only a few sites that are varying. If I assume that all sites have the same probability of evolving, then you tend to get incorrect estimates of branch lengths, and therefore, sometimes incorrect estimates of topology. So um, yeah, so model selection is important. The most important thing being the site rates. Now, the statistical approach that IQ tree uses, I think, is it's great. It, it, it's an objective approach. but um, in, especially in the virus world, there are people that are very adamant that there is a model that should fit, say, HIV or SARS-CoV-2. So with SARS-CoV-2, HKY plus gamma is, is almost always used. And I don't think it matters a huge amount if you have a very large data set and you include your, your site rate categories. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Maybe. I mean, ultimately, the question is, how can I ensure that I'm choosing the best model? I don't know. The, 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 best, the best way would be to use those objective approaches. But again, note that there's different cultures in, in research that might argue that there is the one, the best model for, for a particular organism. And that might be based on, on biological intuition or its statistical behavior. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yes, it could be the case. And this example doesn't show it too clearly, but imagine if this alignment only contained, maybe it was a lot of constant sites and only a few sites were varying. 
In that case, your maximum likelihood tree will look fully resolved, so fully bifurcating, really nice looking tree, but it is only based on a, on a small number of sites. If you do your bootstrapping, then those, um, whatever class of, whatever classification, you know, whatever uh, grouping you have in your tree will be poorly supported. So yes, you do need to present um, support values for your maximum likelihood trees. They do not need to be bootstrap. I, I disagree that bootstrapping is the only way to assess uncertainty. For example, as I mentioned here, concordance factors is also a good way to, to, um, to represent statistical uncertainty in your trees. Uh, yeah. But note that, uh, I mean, I publish a lot, well, not, but some uh, studies using viruses, and sometimes the tree, the topology itself is not hugely important. So unless I'm making very strong claims about the topology, sometimes I might not uh, might, might not show the, the bootstrap values. Maybe we know that it's very uncertain, but we're just showing the tree to show um, where the nodes sit over time. So if we're just interested in time, maybe we don't show those values. But if you are talking about the topology and uh, taxonomy, more importantly, then you do need to have some measure of uncertainty uh, you know, to give you confidence that a particular grouping is, is solid. For example, here, if you didn't present this 54%, then maybe you're, you think that you're super confident that the black bear, brown bear, and cave bear form a monophyletic group. But 54% is, um, if you translate it to probability, which is not exactly probability, but it's like flipping a coin. It's not, you're not that confident. In it. Any other questions? Questions now, please continue. Cool. All right. <clears throat> All right, so the next thing we'll talk about is the molecular clock. And the molecular clock is, is part of the phylogenetic model. I didn't talk about it earlier because I think that the, um, we, we, well, first we need a background on, on phylogenetics to understand the molecular clock, but also because it makes um, the implementations that I find the most convenient use it a Bayesian framework. So we'll talk about molecular clock models when we talk about uh, Bayesian methods, but this these next few slides should give you an intuition as to how the molecular clock works. Let's consider this phylogenetic tree. And here, if because the, the scale bar is substitutions per site, this is a phylogram. So I've collected these four samples. Uh, and it turns out that I have collected them over uh, these four years. So the earliest sample was collected in 2005, next one in 2012, then 2014, and 2016. <clears throat> And this tree looks fine. You would expect, um, and, and maybe think about it, this for a little bit, you would expect that samples collected later should have evolved more from the root of the tree. So this is a rooted tree, as I'm showing here. The root would be around um, this point here. So you expect samples collected later to have evolved more. So we expect more evolution over time. Um, but how do we represent this? So what we'll do is we will consider this uh, this plot here, and we'll have along the y-axis the number of substitutions per site from the root to each of the tips. So just for instance. And in the x-axis, we will have the time when samples were collected. If all goes well, we should expect this sort of trend. So note that my 2016 sample appears to have evolved more than most of the others, and the sample from 2005 has evolved less. It's sitting closer to the root. If I can trace a straight line through this plot, then I'm making some really important assumptions or statements, rather, from a biological standpoint. What this straight line means is that uh, substitutions from the root should accumulate at a roughly constant rate over time. The slope of this line would therefore measure the number of substitutions per site that are accumulating per unit of time. And that is known as the either the substitution rate or the rate of molecular evolution. <clears throat> Once we have estimated this rate of molecular evolution, what we can do is we can take our tree, our phylogram, where recall the branch lengths correspond to substitutions per site, and we can divide them by the evolution rate. Uh, if you think about this in, in the context of units, then the branch lengths are substitutions per site, divide them by the rate, which is substitutions per site divided by time and you end up with branch lines that correspond to time. So then my tree would have units of, of use. The, the molecular clock hypothesis is the hypothesis that um, 
molecular evolution occurs at a predictable rate over time. So basically that this straight line holds. And the implication of the molecular clock is that you can rescale your phylogenetic trees such that the branch, branch lengths correspond to time. And then if this was a, a pathogen, then these internal node events would correspond to uh, perhaps transmission events or migration, like important migration events between different geographic locations. So time trees or chronograms are very powerful and they hinge uh, on, on the assumption of the molecular clock. Um, and again, of course, in, in this case, the, the roots, which would correspond to the origin of, of an outbreak if this was pathogen data, uh, would correspond to the TMRCA, so the time to the most recent common ancestor. You can do these regressions quite easily. Very, very importantly, only do these regressions if you have phylograms. I've seen people do these regressions with chronograms, so trees from, say, beast, and the regression looks absolutely perfect. But if you put a chronogram here, you're doing a regression of time versus time. So that's why they look perfect. Um, so you should be using phylograms for these analysis, either a neighbor joining tree or a maximum likelihood tree. And there's different programs that you can use to get these routes of regressions. The most popular one is probably Tempest. But there are R packages and Python packages that will let you look at these regressions. Now, these regressions are very handy to assess the extent to which the data meet the molecular clock hypothesis. Um, so, oh, and they involve a few useful statistics. The first one is the R squared, also known as the coefficient of determination. And that measures the amount, the extent to which your points deviate from the the straight line here. So you would have seen this in your uh, basic statistics courses. And in the context of the molecular clock, then the R squared really measures how clock-like the data are. If all these points were scattered around this line, like very dispersed, then the data are not quite clock-like. Um, and that's what that is measuring. We don't have a cutoff for, for R squared, by the way. So just, um, yeah, just gives you an idea of clock-like behavior. The slope is a rough estimate of the, the substitution or evolutionary rate. And the x-intercept is, uh, is, is a rough estimate of the TMRCA because, because it, it corresponds to the point in time when there are no substitutions from the roots of the tree. Um, and uh, in Tempest, and I hope that in other programs, you do not report, uh, you do not get a p-value out the p-value here is, is quite controversial. The first aspect to note is that um, if I'm measuring the distance from the root to each of the tips, then I'm traversing some of these branches multiple times. So if I'm tracing the distance from the root to the sample in 2016 and also from the sample in 2014, notice that they share a path along the tree. So uh, the samples are not independent, so we shouldn't be using p-values uh, just like we would in an ordinary regression uh, in this context. Moreover, the p-value only tells you whether the, the slope of the line is different from zero. So sometimes when the data are very messy, these slopes can be negative. So you can have a negative slope with a p-value that says that it is significant. But of course, a negative slope simply means that the data are very messy. It doesn't mean that you're de-evolving, which is what, what that would imply. Mm. So yeah, the p-value, very controversial here. I, I, I wouldn't use it to, to decide that my data behave in a clock-like fashion. These regressions, again, give us a very good intuition, but uh, they're not formal statistical uh, tests. Another way to think about the molecular clock, and this is closer to what phylogenetic methods, uh, explicit phylogenetic methods will do, is consider these two sam these three samples, A, B, and C. And what we'll do is we will measure, uh, we will assume that sample B and sample A were collected at different points in time. And then we will measure their genetic distance to sample C. So if you take the difference in genetic distance from A to C and B to C divided by the difference in sampling times, T, B, and T, A, then you also get an estimate of the evolutionary rate. This is to say that taking samples over time, which is the case for ancient DNA, is immensely useful to understand the molecular clock. But what about trees that are ultrametric? So let's consider this example here. And these are some primates. And we know that uh, for whatever genomic region we are analyzing, the, the, the difference between humans and chimps is 5% uh, genetic difference, at whatever marker I have. Um, but I haven't collected these samples over time. These are all species that exist uh, at present. 
So we don't know whether this corresponds to an old uh, divergence or a more recent one. In that case, you can use fossil data. This uh, fossil is Salanthropus, and I, I don't know what the latest um, research it says, but back when I did this slide, um, we thought that Salanthropus roughly represents the common ancestor between humans and chimps, and that it existed around 6.5 million years ago. So now, by incorporating this information about time, I can get an estimate of the of the evolution rate because I also have genetic distance, <clears throat> and then I can rescale my phylogram to a chronogram where the internal nodes correspond to uh, divergence events. Whether you use a fossil or the sampling times as we did for, for the example above, those are known as molecular clock calibration. So molecular clock calibration is something that allows you to disentangle uh, time and genetic distance. Those two are actually known uh, or are referred to as being uh, non-identifiable. And the only way of getting around the non-identifiability problem is by including um, some sort of molecular clock calibration. So now let's go through a concept review of the molecular clock. So the molecular clock is the assumption that substitutions accumulate at a roughly constant rate over time. Additional information, such as sequence sampling times, if you have a, a rapidly evolving organism, so microbes are particularly good for this, or, or data that involve ancient DNA, uh, or fossil data are required for molecular clock calibration. And this is because rates and times are unidentifiable. The route to progression is a very useful visual inspection but it has uh, major statistical limitations. Please do not interpret the p-values of the root to tip progression. And one thing I forgot, forgot to say is that the root to tip progression is also helpful for identifying problems with the data. Um, I'll have an example of that a bit later. Are there any questions about the molecular clock? All right. Um, so next, uh, I will talk about the, the Bayesian phylogenetic framework and some of the key concepts. Uh, in the prep that you'll do today, uh, I hope that you'll get a much better grasp about how we explore, um, yeah, how we do Bayesian inference in, in, in practice, but this should give you a few key, key concepts that should hopefully, um, yeah, give you uh, enough of a stage for, for the prep. So we call that a maximum likelihood. Um, what we were asking is, well, given a, a phylogenetic tree and a substitution model, what is the probability of obtaining a sequence alignment? In Bayesian inference, what we'll do is the opposite. We'll say, well, given my sequence alignment, what is the probability of, of, of the model that I have at hand? <clears throat> and for this reason, Bayesian inference is also known as the, the as inverse probability. So one of the um, developers of Bayesian inference, uh, Laplace, uh, he, he actually didn't call it Bayesian inference, but the, the inverse probability theorem. And the thing that we, or a few things that we need to bear in mind when we do Bayesian inference is first that we'll assume that parameters have distributions. So this is known as a probabilistic method, and that means that all parameters have probability distributions. Before the data are observed, each parameter has a prior distribution, and a prior represents independent knowledge or our independent understanding of a parameter before we have had a look at the data. The likelihood of the data need to be computed. We will be using the same likelihood function that we talked about before, but as opposed to maximum likelihood, is it is not maximized. We want to sample uh, the parameter space as opposed to just maximizing it. And the prior distribution is combined with the likelihood to yield the posterior distribution. The posterior is the goal of Bayesian inference, and the posterior comes in the form of trees and, and, and parameter distributions. <clears throat> um, this is, this is one way to express um, what we understand as the posterior. So the posterior is proportional to the prior multiplied by the likelihood. The posterior is what we want to estimate. The prior is specified by the user, and it should be, in general, independent of the data. And then the likelihood is calculated from the data. It's the same phylogenetic likelihood that we looked at before. So to give you an intuition of, of how Bayesian inference works, consider a, uh, a situation where I'm going to flip a coin. So, uh, and I'll ask you, what is the probability that the coin will land heads? Before I have flipped the coin, you might say, well, it's probably a fair coin, so my prior will be somewhere around here. I'll just say that it's it's probably um, it's probably a fair coin. So the probability of heads is probably not 0.5. I'll flip it once, and it's tails. So that's my likelihood. And that means that the posterior will be somewhere in between the, the likelihood and the prior. So you might say, well, fine, so it's tails, they're... Um, Maybe it's not a fair coin. 
But what if I flip the coin, I don't know, a thousand times and it keeps on coming tails? Then the pursuit will look more and more like the likelihood. Our prior hasn't changed. So this is to say that when you have very informative data, the prior uh, shouldn't be overly influential. Um, and the posterior should look more and more like the likelihood. Our goal is not for the posterior to be equal to the likelihood. It depends on what parameters we are uh, we're, we're, we're investigating. But in fundamental models, we're not really just flipping a coin. We have many more parameters. They're they're much more complex. So in general, we want to we will want to uh, estimate a phylogenetic tree, which could be a chronogram or a phylogram. We will also want to estimate substitution model parameters and also evolution rates and times. And this is where uh, Bayesian inference, I think, has an edge over maximum likelihood inference when you want to fit very uh, complex models. And this is what the posterior looks like for a, a, a full phylogenetic model that involves an epidemiological process. And the posterior distribution, therefore, is the probability of a full model. It involves a tree an epidemiological branching process, the substitution model, and a molecular clock given a sequence alignment. <clears throat> and that is equal to this term here, the probability of the alignment given the model, which is basically just the phylogenetic likelihood, multiplied by, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> all these terms here. And all these terms here correspond to the prior. Um, so this is the probability of the tree given um, our branching model, the probability of the branching model, the probability of the substitution model, and the probability of the clock model. All this is divided by this um, value here, which we'll talk more about a bit later. <clears throat> <clears throat> so for the tree prior, we can use an epidemiological process to generate chronograms. The tree prior should always be generated chronograms. That's really important. And notice that the phylogenetic likelihood is obtained by multiplying the branching times from that chronogram by a rate to obtain a phylogram. So that's just to focus on this first term here on the right side of the equation. This is the probability of the alignment given a tree substitution model and the clock. The clock is only here because this tree is a chronogram. So the clock will allow us to go from a chronogram to a phylogram such that we can calculate the phylogenetic likelihood, which we talked about earlier. Notice also there's this um, normalizing constant um, in, the, in the denominator. And uh, it is actually known as a marginal likelihood. And it's very useful for model selection, but not usually computed when you run your typical um, Bayesian analysis. So just as a concept review, Bayesian analysis also require computing a likelihood. It's the same phylogenetic likelihood we had before, but remember that it is not maximized. The prior is an essential component of Bayesian analysis and usually obtained independently of the data. So it should represent your understanding of the parameter before you've even looked at your data. And we can specify more sophisticated models via the tree prior and, and the, the molecular clock model. If you're interested in, in, in much more, uh, a much more detailed uh, overview, then this is a very good um, review on, um, on Bayesian molecular dating. Right, now we'll talk about how we can incorporate time and, and demography in, in Bayesian analysis. So the simplest approach that we can take to the molecular clock, which is the one we talked about earlier, is the strict molecular clock. And in the context of the probability density or um, a probability distribution, it looks like this. So we've got a single evolutionary rate that governs uh, my phylogenetic tree. But in fact, that might not always hold. So let's go back to an example where we have collected samples over time and done our route to tip regression. Notice that this sample here from 2014 sits below, well below the regression line. As long as the sample, and I've put here a star, data quality issues aside, as long as the sample is labeled correctly, there's no recombination or anything funny going on. So if we're confident that our data is correct and there's a sample sitting here, then we'll say, well, maybe evolution was a bit slower along the, the branch leading up to that sample. So what we will do is we will um, come up with a prior distribution. And this prior distribution really represents a molecular clock model where branches would be allowed to have different rates. So we'll say that the branch leading up to um, here will have a rate J, and this will be a faster rate than, than the rate that is assigned to, to, this, to the branch leading up to the 2014 sample. Uh, and we can do this in a, in a Bayesian context in a very convenient mathematical framework. 
In fact, the approach that we can take here is known as a relaxed molecular clock. And under the relaxed molecular clock, what we do is we will uh, propose a statistical distribution, for example, a gamma distribution or log normal distribution, and then draw samples from that distribution and assign those samples to the branches as rates. So every branch can have a different rate, and these are independent draws from some statistical distribution. I've put here, again, the two examples, like gamma or log normal, which would be the most popular approaches. And these, of course, have their own parameters. For example, the gamma distribution has an alpha and beta parameter, and the log normal has a mean and a, and a standard deviation. So, and you could propose any other distribution that you like for, for the rate. But the underlying assumption here is that branch rates are all different, and there are draws from some statistical distribution. Another approach that you can take is known as uh, the local molecular clock framework. And here, what we'll do is we will, um, based on biological knowledge, we will assign evolutionary rates to different branches. For example, this is a study in 2014 that looked at uh, influenza evolving in horses, uh, pigs, and humans, and in horses. Ah, oh, horses again, yeah. Uh, and what they did is they uh, allowed uh, the clades belonging to humans, uh, pigs, and horses to have rates that were different to the background. And um, and you can just do this, yeah, just based on your biological intuition uh, and, and the, the, the analysis will simply estimate these rates for you. What they found here was that the rates were actually quite different. So flu evolves uh, faster in some organisms compared to others, and particularly in, in, particular in swine uh, and, and birds, it evolved faster than it did in humans and, and horses. There's a lot more than one can discuss about the molecular clock, but then the other aspect that we do need to bear in mind is the tree prior. And the tree prior is a process that will generate chronograms. The process by which we can generate these chronograms will take the form of, of a branching process. So you, if, you, if you're very mathematically inclined, then you might know about stochastic processes, and, and you can use these to generate trees. Um, but most approaches will probably take a, a coalescent approach. So this comes from population genetics. And the, the idea behind this is that different demographic processes will generate trees with different shapes. So uh, just the plots here at the bottom are showing the effective population size as a function of time. The first one is um, an exponentially growing population. And you can see that the tree has a very different shape to a tree sample from a population that is constant. The branch lengths are, the, the, the nodes have a very different distribution. So choosing a tree prior is hard. You can use uh, model selection methods. You can also use your intuition. So if you're analyzing an epidemic, you might want a, an exponential growth model. But if you don't care about the, the demographic model that much, then in general, if your sequence data are very informative, then the tree prior doesn't have a huge impact in general. Or another approach that you can take is to use a very flexible uh, tree prior. For example, skyline models are very flexible, and that's what you'll be using the PRAC later today. Now, concept review around um, molecular clock models and tree priors. So note that uh, Bayesian molecular clock models can be proposed based on statistical convenience or biological motivation. I talked about these relaxed molecular clocks. I don't think anyone believes that evolution uh, looks like, a, like random samples from a statistical distribution in the context of the molecular clock. But statistically, they're very convenient. Um, and they do allow us to, to make uh, robust inferences of times, especially. Demographic or epidemiological models can inform us about changes in population size. Remember the, the case where we have an exponentially growing population, um, and also about genetic diversity. And they are incorporated via the tree prior. Um, and uh, I, I, I wanted to include here uh, some some slides on how to sample the posterior distribution and summarize parameters, but I don't have enough time. So you will talk about this in the prac later today. OK, and finally, I will talk a little bit about uh, practical applications of molecular clocks in ancient DNA data, which I hope is somewhat relevant to, to, to what your individual research projects are. Um, so there's a few things to consider when you're analyzing ancient DNA data. The first one is uh, that it's usually very informative. And this is because the sampling window um, can be quite wide. So here in this illustration, we, we wanted to show that including ancient DNA, which might be the samples here um, in the second to last clade, um, 
increase the, the, the time window over which uh, the data are collected. And that means that you might, you're likely to get better molecular clock inferences because you're capturing a larger window, or a larger amount of time. So you can capture more evolutionary change. Often ancient DNA data have lots of variable sites, which is great. Sometimes you can estimate really good trees, but it also means that there's a lot of computing involved. So the likelihood function or the likelihood calculations are very intense sometimes. Um, sometimes that limits the, the, the complexity of the models that we apply. So a bit of a trade-off. Um, and another thing to bear in mind is that the, even though we have a, a better sampling time window for our analysis for molecular clock calibration, the molecular clock rarely, rarely holds. So in some pathogens, like say uh, plague, uh, sometimes it appears to evolve very slowly for long periods of time. Uh, and then it evolves very quickly when there's an outbreak. So modeling that from a molecular clock framework is, is sometimes quite challenging. So you, you have to often deviate from the standard molecular clock dating methods. So the first example that I wanted to, to discuss is uh, the molecular clock of, of uh, plague, Yersinia pestis. This is a study that is a preprint at the moment, but what we did here is uh, we collected um, Yersinia pestis genomes from different uh, pandemics and outbreaks over time, uh, from you know really old ones thousands of years ago to, to more recent ones. And what we wanted to investigate here was, well, what does the molecular clock of, of plague look like? overall. And this is, I think this is a very useful figure. This is a, a rotative regression of all the plague data that we had. So we estimated a phylogram using maximum likelihood and then did our rotative progression. And you can see that it doesn't look like the examples I showed above. Um, some of these uh, uh, data sets or outbreaks or pandemics uh, are shown here with the, with the colors, with the ovals. And you can see this one here Zero pre is a data set that seems to have some clock-like signal. It has a very steep rate, so as if it had evolved very quickly, but it's got, it looks quite different to, to, to the rest. And all the modern samples shown here uh, don't seem to have very much of a molecular clock at all. So overall, this pathogen must go periods where it evolves quickly or slowly. And, and that means that the, the, the standard molecular clock, the strict molecular clock uh, breaks down. So what we did is we, we repeated these regressions for individual outbreaks or pandemics, and, and this is what some of them look like. So this is that zero pre data set, and you can see that it's got a very neat regression here. So we say that this one has low rate variation, very nice clock-like behavior. You can see the, um, the coefficient of determination, this R squared, it's not 0.92, so very good. This is one that has, uh, we, we classify this one as having moderate rate variation, so R squared of not 0.76. There's some scattering of the points around, but overall looks nice and positive. And this is one that looks quite bad. So it's got an R squared of 0.02, but most importantly, the slope of the line is negative. So this just means that there is no clock-like signal here. The data are not sufficiently informative or too noisy to give us any molecular clock signal. But a problem with the rotative regression is that, as I said before, it's not a formal statistical test. So we used this, um, this approach known as uh, BETS, Bayesian Evaluation of Temporal Signal. And the idea behind this test is that we will run two Bayesian analysis. One, where we include our sampling time. So we've got the molecular clock calibration. Everything's, uh, uh, everything should be nice and informative. And, and, and the tree ideally should look like this. And then we will completely ignore the sampling times such that we will enforce the tree to be ultrametric like this one. And uh, what the analysis will do is it will tell us whether the data preferred to be ultrametric or, or to have the actual dates. If the data preferred to be ultrametric, note that the ultrametric is a simpler model because um, there's one parameter that you cannot estimate. You cannot estimate the, the evolutionary rate. You have to fix it to a certain value or, uh, yeah, you actually have to fix it to a certain value or you have to fix the time. So um, if the data preferred this model, then what it's stating is that uh, the sequence sampling times are not informative for the data set I have at hand. If, in contrast, the data support this model, the non-ultrametric tree, then we know that the sampling times are being informative uh, about how our data evolved. And the way we do this is we run an analysis and then we estimate that quantity I talked about before, the marginal likelihood, and then we calculate a base factor. The base factor is simply how much statistical support we have in favor of a model. 
Uh, I'm more than happy to talk about that later if anyone wants, but I just don't have enough time in this talk. So a base factor that is positive supports a model where we include sampling time, so the non-ultrametric tree. And this is a screenshot of the um, of a spreadsheet where we were logging all the uh, the base factors and, and some other aspects of the data set and the best model that was selected. And what I wanted to highlight here is that uh, if you notice, it starts at the zero pre one that has this regression. So it's got a very nice regression, but the base factor is negative. And the optimal uh, molecular clock model combination is a relaxed molecular clock with no sampling times. And that's cut. I mean, that, that kind of contradicts what you what you see when you look at this regression. But the problem is that these Bayesian analyses are quite, um, they require relatively informative data. This one only includes eight samples. So uh, using a, a sophisticated Bayesian analysis with lots of different parameters is probably overkill for this data set. And therefore, it chooses the simplest model. Um, we should probably be looking at, at simplifying the model as much as possible in order to tease out whether uh, there is true temporal signal, which there probably is when you look at this regression. Others are much much closer to what you would expect. So if you look at uh, one pre here, this regression here, this one does seem to have uh, good temporal signal. So the base factor is 44.1. So that's very strong positive evidence that uh, that there is a, a molecular clock that we can tease out for that, that data set. And in contrast, this uh, two medieval uh, data set, uh, shown here, it has uh, 3.9 is actually very small evidence for, for there being a molecular clock. What probably happens here is that if you look at this, it supports a, a relaxed clock. So the relaxed clock will allow us to account for rate variation. So the root to serve regression is probably hiding a small amount of, of temporal signal in this data. And this is not to, to argue that that the root to progression is not useful. It's just that it doesn't give us the full picture about the evolution of, of whatever uh, data set we're analyzing. And another example that I wanted to, to talk about, which has, uh, I think this is quite a nifty application of, of Bayesian molecular clocks. And this is uh, pertaining to the molecular clock of hepatitis B virus. So uh, with a group of colleagues, actually, I, I wasn't involved in the sample collection, but they, it's really exciting. They found a mummy, an Italian mummy, um, this was a child, and it had uh, hepatitis B in, in its bones. So they were able to sequence hepatitis B. And this is a 16th century mummy, so that was quite striking. But actually, we found another study where a Korean uh, team found uh, hep B virus also in a Korean mummy from around the same time. What's really weird about this is when you estimate a phylogenetic tree of modern hep B and the mummies, the mummies actually fall within the modern diversity of hep B. What we would expect is that the ancient samples should fall basal to the uh, to the circulating modern diversity of hep B. So that raised the question as to whether these samples were modern contaminants or ancient. And of course, you can check this uh, by running lots of molecular tests. But what, what does the molecular clock tell us about this? Is there any evidence from the molecular clock that these samples are modern or ancient? And to do this, we devised a, um, a, a Bayesian test, where what we do is we will specify all our modern samples, assign them dates. But then for those ancient samples that are a bit suspicious, what we'll do is we will assign a uniform prior distribution. So the, um, for instance, in the top one here, the blue uh, flat shaded distribution is, is the prior. And in this case, we will use a uniform distribution between the collection time, so somewhere in, sometime in the 16th century, and the present, that's our prior. And we will do the same for the, the other sample here, shown with the um, red uh, kind of flat curve uh, in the background. And what we expect, so what we're doing is we're treating the ages of the samples as parameters. If the data were modern contaminants and the molecular clock have a strong signal, then what we would expect is the, uh, the continuous lines to be to reflect the, the posterior. So the posterior should reflect, should have a lot of density on recent times. In contrast, if there are real ancient samples and this is supported by the molecular clock, then we would expect the dashed line, the, the posterior to look more like the dashed line. So there should be a lot of density in, in, in old, um, old ages. And we've used this, we've, we've used this framework before for um, modern 
pathogens that have very good quality sequence uh, data, like uh, like flu, and you can do this for for SARS-CoV-2 as well for HIV. But with HMV DNA, it was a bit more challenging. And this is what we found: the um, the, the two mummy samples are shown with orange and blue, and the light colors correspond, or the light shades correspond to the prior, and the darker shades correspond to the the posterior. So data corresponds to the sample, the, the analysis that has that has data. So therefore, it's the posterior distribution, and uh, they're kind of indistinguishable. So this means that the data are not sufficiently informative to override the prior. I think this is a useful test, but Heb B is notorious for having for, for being very difficult. Uh, to, to draw uh, molecular clock signals from. So, uh, so yeah, this is it's it, this was kind of still inconclusive. Uh, the samples are probably authentic. There's many reasons to believe that they are, um, but but the, the Bayesian analysis doesn't let us resolve this. But this is a test that could be used for other data sets, I believe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. Uh, all right. So, thanks for that. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Please send an email if you have any questions or uh, anything wasn't clear, or you can ask me now or, or later. I'll be around for a little bit. And uh, yeah, thank you for listening.